Hello, and welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Class for Wednesday, December 9th here at the Franklin Church of Christ. Might look a little bit brighter on your Facebook or YouTube screen because we recorded this last night. However, uh, it did not record sound. So I'm redoing the lesson for you for Facebook and for YouTube. And we are coming to you from Thursday morning, December 10th, from here at the church building. So I hope you find this lesson well. I shared these uh, announcements last night with uh, ones, uh, ones that were in attendance. Please continue. We are having Sunday school on Sunday mornings at 930 and worship at 1030. And also, we are having in-person services on Wednesday nights at 630 p.m. Everyone counts. We're collecting again this coming Sunday. It was last Sunday morning. <clears throat> and as I said, we're collecting again this coming Sunday. The collection box is out in the foyer. If, however, you cannot make it to the building, just please call us at the office or send the donation to the church building. Angel Tree Gifts, if you're participating in that, those gifts need to be returned to the church building by this coming Sunday, December 13th. And also, if you see there at the bottom, Christmas Carolyn, we're going to do this a little bit different. Uh, you will receive a one call either tonight or tomorrow about Christmas Carolyn, but all those that would like to participate are asked to show up at 2 p.m., I'll have assignments for everyone, and we'll be ready to go this coming Sunday, December 13th at 2 p.m. to go out and safely do some Christmas carolings to our shut-ins and others that have not been able to get out during all this um, COVID-19 pandemic things going on. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you for today, and we thank you for all the many blessings that you bestow upon us. We ask and pray to be with all those on our prayer list, and be with all those in our number that are uh, just out on their daily daily walk with you, whether it be at home, uh, on the job, doing schoolwork, whatever the case may be. Dear Father, just continue to be with us, and we ask you to bless our, bless our lives, and let us continue to bless you with our daily walk and our lives that we live for you on, on, that, ba on that daily basis. Thank you again for sending your son. It's his name we pray. Amen. Well, we've been continuing our series on Wednesday nights called Lost and Found. And we've been doing this, uh, just trying to find some good things in our lives that we need to focus upon, and then losing maybe some of the bad things to help us better, better uh, acquaint ourselves with you um, as our Heavenly Father and with Jesus Christ in our lives. This week we're going to discuss trying to lose some excuses in our lives. Hopefully we can learn how excuses get in the way of us fulfilling our service to God. So that's what I hope to get across today or tonight from last night, excuse me, uh, with the word excuses. If you think about the word excuses, what does it mean? Well, the noun form of the word is a reason or explanation put forward to defend or justify a fault or offense. And then if you look at the verb form uh, version of the word, an excuse to exempt from a task or obligation to serve as an explanation that vindicates or justifies an action. So really, what's the big deal with this word? Well, if you look at it from a real perspective, you look at this little slide right here, excuses. Basically, the excuse is the lie you tell yourself to make yourself feel better about justifying your lack of responsibility for your own life and the life of your family. A, an excuse is a lie. And we try, to, we try to have those and we try to give reason to them, but if we ultimately look at them, if we use excuses in our lives, we are ultimately lying to ourselves and we're lying to others around us. So we have to be careful of this. I shared this little slide last night and I shared it with you this morning. There's an important distinction between two words. Well, you say, I have a reason for something in your life, or you don't really say it's an excuse. You might give an excuse and, and try to make it a reason, but that's not the case. They are two differently, they're two totally different, excuse me, two totally different words. And a, a reason is an explanation given to an event or a series of events. It's an actual explanation of why you were not there, why you couldn't come, why you couldn't participate. An excuse is intended to lessen your responsibility, Res lessen your simple liability to that. You know, it's your accountability to something, and you give that an excuse. 
it's supposed to lessen what you're supposed to do. But in, in all reality, it could be a lie to why you're trying to get out of that. And I'm going to show you that. Uh, this lady kind of gave this uh, on the internet. It was a nice little chart there by Kelly Rudolph, and I'm, that's why I shared it with you. So if you look at it, you know, you might have some specific reasons in your life that you might not be able to attend something or go somewhere, go to work, go to school. You know, your reason is I got sick. Well, yes, we do get sick. We get sick and we cannot go. We can't get out of bed. We can't get away from the bathroom or something like that in that regard so we do get sick so that is a legitimate reason sometimes we have to go to a funeral we have to go to someone's funeral because they're either kin to us they're our best friends or we just want to be there for the family so we take off of work we take away maybe another function that we had scheduled and that is a legitimate reason to go to a funeral another maybe reason you might use i've been called into work you know, many of us have different job hours that we have. Maybe some of us work first shift, but we have to work longer hours. Or maybe we're working different shifts and we have to add an extra day. Those are legitimate reasons why you might not be able to attend a family event. Uh, maybe a family sporting, a kid's sporting event. Or maybe even attending church. Unfortunately, work takes us away from church. So you have that reason. But then we come up with excuses, and you know with these excuses, you hear it from your kids, you shared them as when you were children, or maybe you even still do it as an adult. I just don't feel well. Maybe you just got up on the wrong side of the bed, and you're grumpy, and you're tired, and you call in to, sick, you call in to work sick that day, but then you go out shopping that day. Well, you used an excuse not to go to work. You see where I'm going with that? You used that excuse. I just don't want to poo because my dog isn't feeling good. How many times have we used someone else in an excuse to get out of something? Well, my child has a uh, something going on. I can't come. My dog isn't feeling well, so I need to stay at home like this example is going. Well, my spouse couldn't come or this and that. You try to use somebody else and put the blame on them when the blame is really in your mind. And then you can just think of others in your life. I don't have, I don't have, and I don't have, I don't have time, I don't have this, I don't have it. You come up with an excuse and we find that excuse to get out of something. Why do so many of us have all these excuses, 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 all in our life and everything that we do? Well, four weeks ago, I shared a lesson with you on the lesson of the best seats in the house, finding humbleness in your life. It was four weeks ago, actually, and if you'd like to go back to that, it was on November 18th to be exact, and you can look that up on maybe Facebook or our YouTube channel to go back and look at that lesson. In that lesson, we talked about the time when Jesus was at the home of a Pharisee. He ended up healing a man on the Sabbath day, and they began to judge him. And afterwards, many started to fight for places to get closer to him to learn more about who he was and what he was doing. He saw them fighting over these seats, and that is where we learned how to choose and work hard for the correct seat or the best seats in the house to serve the Lord. You know, that story is continued in Luke chapter 14, verse 12, and we're going to read that passage in a moment. He begins to tell the host whom he should be and should not be inviting to his home. He was trying to get the point across of becoming humbler. And that's what we learned about four weeks ago, how to be more humble. And Jesus is going to take that on a little bit more here and help him be more humbler, but also understand the people that are giving him the excuse. He wanted him to make sure that he had the right people in the right seats at his house. So let's look at these passages from Luke chapter 14, verses 12 through 24. I'm using the English Standard Version up on the screen behind me, so if you'd like to read along. He said, he said also to the man who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. 
Verse 15 continues, When one of those who reclined at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. This is where he started in the parable. Jesus taught in these parables to tell stories for people to better understand, to get the point across. And here's where he starts that. And at that time, the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all, <clears throat> but they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field, and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another one said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another one said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. In verse 22, and the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done, and there is still room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come, in that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. If we go back and look, if you go back at those passages and look, the parable of the banquet, in verses, four, in verses 12 and 14 of chapter 14, Jesus, as I said, is telling the host whom he should and should not invite and whom he should serve at this banquet or at his home, excuse me. And then he goes on to tell him about this parable of the banquet. And he uses these examples, like I said, to get the point across in a little bit easier message. And then he began to hear what Jesus was saying about all these people beginning to make excuses. Remember, one said, I bought some land. I got to go check on it. Well, could he have not checked on it at another time? Could he have not just waited until after the time? Could he have not just gone to the home just for a short period of time and then gone check that line and just make an appearance? One had just bought the five, oaks, five oak yoke of oxen. Could he have not done that earlier in the day to go check those oxen that he just bought? Does he have to sit there and baby and coddle them the whole time? Could he not just go at a later time? Then one man said, hey, I even got married. I can't come. Well, just bring your wife. Why don't you bring your wife to my home so she can enjoy fellowship with us? And then one just said, hey, I can't come. Well, they, gave an, they didn't really give an excuse. They just said, I'm not coming. They were flat out. They didn't give a reason. They didn't give an excuse, but they did just say, I wasn't coming. So the owner asked the servant to invite all in, and he did. He went out and found the crippled. He found the, the lame. He found the ones that needed to be there besides the other ones that might not have needed to be there. So here's something I want you to think about. What does it cost us to obey God? What does it cost us to be true disciples of our Heavenly Father? How much do we need or have to give back to ultimately serve Him in our everyday lives? The answer can be found in this next scripture verse that I have up on the screen, the true cost of discipleship in Luke 9, verses 57 through 62. As a Christian, we must be ready to give Jesus complete loyalty in all things that we do, whether it is in our home, in school, in our workplace, or just out in the community. True discipleship will help us be the followers of Jesus we need to be. So let's look, read this passage together. Luke 9, verses 57 through 62. <clears throat> the English Standard Version again. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man is nowhere, has nowhere to lay his head. To another one he said, Follow me. And he said, Lord, let me first go and bear, excuse me, bury my father, and Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another one said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at any home. And Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand 
in the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now, many might look at this statement and say, this is pretty harsh. Jesus isn't letting him just go and bury his own father. Jesus isn't letting him go and say bye to other people. Jesus isn't letting him take care of his home and other material comforts. Well, yeah, that's exactly right. But here's the point. Jesus is more important than all those. I've said this before in other lessons. If we put Jesus first in our lives, everything else is going to be taken care of. And we'll, get, we'll show another example of that here in one moment. Because you look at these, this passage, the example illustrates that Christian discipleship takes precedence over material things. We might have to give up some things to follow Jesus. We might have to give up some other activities to attend church or attend this event or attend a, a fellowship meal with someone or just to pray with a brother in Christ or to just share in the love or, uh, or go through the pains and agonies that they're going through. That's, that's getting rid of maybe some of those material comforts to serve our Heavenly Father. Social duties and family responsibilities. We might not be able to go somewhere to bury someone in our family because we have to take care of maybe another issue that involves Jesus Christ in our lives. And that's okay. People need to understand that, that something might come up. But Jesus Christ takes precedence, unfortunately, over that. And I think that's what he's getting across. It's not a harsh statement. It's just something maybe we need to do to make sure we're following Christ. Because that last point is Christ's followers must per persist until excuse me, persist until the end. We have to persist until the end to make sure that we're doing the things we need to do to receive that heavenly home one day when he comes back. Because I want you to look at this slide. Jesus first. What's this picture really trying to tell us? Well, it's trying to tell us we need to keep moving forward. As you see there, you're sitting in a car, the window, the long road ahead of you. Christ is there in your mirror, gives a little picture of the cross. But what's right there in that rear view mirror? Can you tell it on the screen? That's right, it's the world. We need to be moving forward. We need to be moving in the straight direction to follow Jesus Christ and leave the world behind us. We need to leave it in the back rear view mirror and just keep moving ahead in everything we do. Because it's going to help us be a disciple that we need to be. It's going to help us go out and make disciples of others that we come in contact with. And it's going to help us be the church that we need to be on a daily basis. And it all goes back to no excuses. Just like that Jesus first picture that I just showed two slides ago. This picture does the same thing. If you look forward there, what's the straight arrow? The straight arrow is going to no excuses. No excuses are there to get in the way. But what happens if we do have excuses? It takes us off the straight path that we're trying to follow. There comes a point in one's life where we need to get rid of the excuses. We will have to face the music sometimes or pay the piper as the state saying used to go. The bills will always come due and one day our bill will come due. We as Christians are expected to do the will of God because he commands us to do so. Is it easy? No, it's not going to be easy. Is it hard? Yes, it can be hard because things are going to get in the way. Tough decisions are going to have to be made. And we need to make sure that the first and foremost decision is God and Jesus Christ at the forefront. We have a lot of factors get in the way, but if we keep our eyes on the prize, then we will stay focused. Found this little quote on the internet. It comes to us from Cora Teen Toon. I think that's how you pronounce her name there. If you look at the world, you will be distressed. If you will look within, you'll be depressed. If you look at God, you will be at rest. The reward for this obedience is eternal life in heaven with him. And we've been extended an invitation to his reward by him. We must take responsibility for our actions and decisions, for they will shape our whole lives. We must make sure that the decisions we make are godly and that we live according to the Word of God. There is no excuse we can give that will allow us to sidestep doing the will of God. Our daily focus must be on Jesus 
And that's what he wants. If we read this passage here, Romans 8, 8 verses 1 through 3, on the, right, on the right hand screen, the left, on my left shoulder. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has, has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of the sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Our focus must be on the heavenly father and his son. What about the little passage right there on the right? Who cares what the world thinks? That's what we have to think, and that's what we have to go by when we're following God. Who cares what the world thinks? Because it's all about what God thinks of us, not what the world thinks. We have to keep focused on him and stay strong because the enemy wants to us to fail, and you were born to win. Satan wants us to fail, but we're born to win, and we're born to win for God. And we have to be careful because our wants and our desires, they're meaningless. They're meaningless when it comes to obeying the will of the Father. The excuses we give God as to why we do not follow him will or, or have never had any effect, shall not have any effect, and will not ever work. The excuses that were in the past from that parable that Jesus shared, they didn't work. So any of the excuses we try to come up, they're not going to work either. We have to make sure that we're following God. And as I said just a while ago, this has happened throughout the Bible. People have given excuses all throughout the Bible. And think about this. Think about the children of Israel in the Old Testament. Read this passage along with me. Exodus 20, verses 3 through 5. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Wow, what a statement. He is a jealous God. And some people look at that and say, well, he shouldn't be jealous. Why is he jealous of us? Well, he's our creator. He's our heavenly father. And that's who we need to follow. But I think we need to realize, even though he is a jealous God, that jealousy that he has is a love that is never ending for us. He loves us no matter what. Even when we are sinners, Christ loves us. God loves us no matter what. He wants us to return. We need to return to the Father. Whenever that case may be, whatever, whatever comes up in our lives, we need to return to our Father. We need to return to Him because His Son remembered us. He and His Son remembered us. And I think this key is this is key right here. We were created in God's image to do two things on earth. I think this is a good little statement here. Learn to love God. That's number one. And we've got to learn to love other people. Sometimes that's hard. But through God, there's no excuses. We need to love no other people no matter what. Whatever their sin in their life or whatever they're going through, we need to love them. Shared a statement with someone yesterday. We need to love the sinner, but we can hate the sin. We just still need to love other people because God even loves them. God loves them. He's jealous. He wants them to be right there, but some people turn him away. But he still loves them. But he doesn't maybe like what they're doing. And that's us too. And it might come to you. We need to love ourselves. Even though we might be going through struggles and ups and downs that take us away from God. Read this passage along with me. Romans 5, 7 through 9. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person. Though perhaps for a good person one would dare um, <clears throat> dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were all still sinners, I shared this just a moment ago, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. All of us have our faults. But no matter what we all are all tied to God, we're all tied to the love of God. Because we are created in his image. I'd like to leave you with this quote. 
This was from Pope Francis. It says, let us never lose hope. God loves us always, even with our mistakes and our sins. We must get rid of excuses in our lives that take us away from God. I want you to think to yourself, is there a real reason for it or is it an excuse? One final slide here. Either you will find a way or you're going to find an excuse. Let's find our way to our Heavenly Father. Let's find our way to God. And let's get rid of the excuses that keep us from Him. Thank you again. Have a good rest of the day and the rest of the week. We look forward to seeing you with us at church on Sunday morning, whether in person or on Facebook or YouTube. Thank you again. May God bless you and your family. I leave you with this passage up here. Think about it. Either you will find a way to serve God and Jesus, or you will find an excuse. God bless you.